Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to this PhD support group meeting, this Tuesday session of the weekly UKZN Doctoral Academy program. I'm Lenny Liebenberg. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, so uh, as, as usual, just to start off with an intro to new participants, uh, this is a very casual, very supportive space, and we really, really encourage interaction uh, amongst participants and with the, the presenters. So please feel free to uh, use your reaction icons, pop any questions in the chat box, uh, raise your hand if you'd like to say something. If you would prefer to remain anonymous, that's fine as well. You could send me a direct me message and I'm happy to read out your question or your comments to the, the group so that uh, the SSS team today and participants are able to address uh, that comment. Um, Right, so without any further ado, today is a very special on suicide awareness and prevention, and this will be hosted by the UKZN Student Support Services team, particularly uh, Suzanne Stokes, who's a student counselor and educational psychologist in the team. Um, so very, very welcome, Sue. Thank you very much for taking this time to speak with us today to discuss such an important topic. Um, and I'll hand over to you. Absolutely, uh, and a pleasure to be here, and thank you. Um, so I do have my colleague, uh, Wilkenithi Thaber, who is also joining us, who will help me man the chat space. So as we start this talk, I'm reminded that it is Mental Health Month, and we are surrounded by comments such as, your mental health matters, there is no health without mental health. And I continue to ponder on the fact that we have as a result of suicide, lost too many loved ones, um, stemming mostly from poor mental health. September the 10th is the day we spoke on suicide prevention as a global community. Did you know that at least 75% of all suicides were preventable? Imagine if we spend at most an hour a week focusing our energies and activities and dialogues addressing uh, and engaged in preventative care, self-care, allowing ourselves to be in the care of others or hosting psychoeducation on factors impacting wellness or developing coping strategies or encouraging help seeking behaviors such as better decision making, how different that 75% would be. So I will be addressing all of those aspects in today's session. So this would shift this, this particular pandemic into a whole new dimension. Persons who live with the thought or well, the constant thought of suicide would feel more encouraged to reach out and speak to someone they trust because we are creating the space for change, non-judgmental space that foster acceptance and gives hope. So one is too many. So the World Health Organization reported that there is an estimate of 703,000 people a year take their lives around the world. For every suicide, there are likely 20 other people making a suicide attempt, and many more have ser serious thoughts of suicide. So millions of people suffer intense grief or are otherwise profoundly impacted by the suicidal behaviors. Our aim with suicidal prevention and awareness factors, as per World Health Organization's plea, is to address suicide as a public health concern. And each suicidal death is this public health concern um, with a profound impact on those around them. So by raising awareness, reducing stigmas around suicide and encouraging well-informed action, we can reduce instances of suicide around the world. So with the 10th of September, each year focusing or focuses the attention on the issue, reduces stigma, raises awareness, and gives a singular message that suicide can be prevented. So creating hope through action is the trennial theme for the World Suicide Prevention Day from 2021 up to ne the next year, 2023. And this theme is a reminder that there is, no, there is an alternative to suicide and aims to inspire confidence and light in all of us. So with that introduction to the topic, I am um, encouraged to speak about this creating hope through action. And we can signal to people experiencing suicidal thoughts that there is hope and that we care and want to support them. It also suggests that our actions, no matter how big or small, may provide hope to those who are struggling. 
So building on this theme and spreading this message, a world can be envisioned where suicides are not so prevalent. We all can play a role in supporting those experiencing a suicidal crisis or those bereaved by suicide, whether as a member of society, a child, as a parent, as a friend, as a colleague, or as a person with a lived experience. And we can all encourage understanding about the issue, reach in to people who are struggling, and share our experiences. We can all create hope through action and be the light. So continuing on the concept of creating hope, we see within the media, newspapers, and the digital prints portray suicide in a way that we forget about the life lived. Journalism has been known to sensationalize many stories just to you know, get those sales or the hits on their sites. And this further contributes to those stigmas and misperceptions about suicide and suicidal attempts. It makes having that serious conversation slightly more difficult. So in 2021, suicide is regarded as the 15th highest cause of death worldwide. SADAC, with their journalism project, has successfully shifted the way most journalists share the losses, our losses, in the media. There is a shift in humanizing the loss we feel while maintaining the respect of the lost one and their family and friends. This is something that we too need to continue doing in our own spaces. So I'm going to do just a little bit of the terminology that we find when we're working through uh, on issues of suicide. And Darkheim identifies four different types of suicide, which are egostoic suicide. And that's seen as stemming from the absence of social interaction and integration. And it's committed by individuals who are social outcasts, see themselves as being alone or as an outsider. Altruistic suicide occurs when social group involvement is too high, individuals are too integrated into the group and are willing to sacrifice their own life um, for the uh, greater good and the obligation for the group. A nomoic suicide is caused by the lack of social regulation and occurs during high levels of stress and frustration. A nomoic suicide stems from individuals who suffer extreme financial loss, disappointment and stress um, that individuals face may drive them towards committing suicide as a form of escape. Fatalistic suicide occurs when individuals are kept under tight regulation and these individuals are placed under those extreme rules or high expectations set upon them and which removes their sense of identity and um, self. And this can be seen in slavery or in persecution. And another two terms that we refer to when addressing suicide is the suicidal ideation. It's any self-reported thoughts of engaging in suicide, suicidal related behavior, and includes presence or the absence of suicidal intent and plan. Parasuicide refers to the act of self-harm without the realistic expectation of death. So with the terminology out of the way, I am going to be sharing with you just a short video on these misconceptions of suicide. And I just want to quickly get my sound share already. There we go. So just let me know if the sound is good. Everyone would be better off without me. I couldn't see any other way out. I wish I could go to sleep and never wake up. I wanted all of this to go away. These are the voices of suicidal ideation, which is the thinking that haunts people and brings them to the brink of taking their own lives. Most of us have been touched by suicide in some way. Some of us have personally lost a loved one to suicide, or we know someone who has. Some of us have had suicidal thoughts ourselves or even attempted suicide. Far too many people take their own lives every year in America, with especially concerning rates in veterans and adolescents. We know there are certain situations that add to the risk of people attempting suicide. If they've made an attempt in the past, if a member of their family has attempted or died from suicide, if they own or have easy access to weapons, a lot of unused medication or drugs, or anything else that could be used to attempt suicide. If any of these are true, their risk can increase further if they struggle with mental health problems, 
depressed mood and hopelessness are serious risk factors. Other problems like a recent breakup, job loss, or legal trouble can be important to consider. Or if they use drugs or drink alcohol, both are highly related to death by suicide. And if someone uses much more during difficult times, it's important to notice this. We are completely certain of two things. Suicidal ideation is an emergency, and we can all play an important part of saving someone who might be living it. Here are a few critical things to understand. Most of the time, people don't want to die. Even when things feel very bad, most people truly want to live. People say they just don't want to feel the pain anymore. That's why it's so important for you to know what to look for. So how can you tell if someone in your life needs help and what should you do? First, really listen. This is often the most important thing to do when someone we know is struggling. If a person is thinking of suicide, he or she says so. Sometimes the person literally comes out and says something like, I wish I were dead. Other people may mention suicidal thoughts more passively, saying something like, if I were gone, no one would notice, or I have nothing to live for, or I just wish all of this would stop. Then watch. Heavy or increased drug or alcohol use can be a warning sign if someone has been thinking of suicide. Also, pay attention if someone is socially isolated or if someone tells you he or she is feeling overwhelmed by stressful situations that don't seem to have solutions. We need to notice when our friends and family are having more trouble than they usually do. Finally, ask. If anything does not feel or sound right to you, or if you're worried at all, ask about it. Make it straightforward and don't be afraid. Use these words. Are you thinking of killing yourself? You will not give someone the idea if that person wasn't already considering it. In fact, most of the time, people feel relieved that they can talk about what they're struggling with, and you very well might save their lives. If you think someone is in danger of suicide, stay with them and get help. If your friend or loved one admits to thinking about suicide, make sure the situation is safe and stay with the person. Validate his or her feelings and listen without judgment, even if it's scary. Encourage the person to get professional help right away and help if necessary, even if this means calling 911 or going to the hospital. Every one of us has a role to play in preventing suicide. If you are feeling like suicide might be an option for you, please be brave and ask for help. If you're worried about someone you care about, be the one who asks the all-important question. You could very well save that person's life. I will share with you the South African contact details for the helplines in a moment. Um, but just coming back to the video, I thought it was really quite impactful um, when they spoke about those misconceptions of suicide, that people who talk about suicide won't really do it. Almost everyone who attempts suicide has given some clue or warning. So we should not ignore um, even the indirect references to death or suicide. Statements like, you'll be sorry when I'm gone, or I can't see any way out, no matter how casually or jokingly it's been said, take it as a serious suicidal feeling. Another misperception can be people who die by suicide are people who are unwilling to seek help. Many a times people who um, attempt at suicide have reached out for help before. Studies indicate that more than 50% of suicide victims have sought medical help in the six months prior to their deaths. Talking about suicide may give someone the idea, and that's a huge misperception. By speaking about um, suicide, we tend to normalize their experience. You don't give someone the suicidal ideas by talking about suicide. The opposite is true. Talking openly and honestly about suicidal thoughts and feelings can actually save a life. If someone is determined to kill themselves, the misperception is that nothing is going to stop them. We know that this is untrue. Rather than wanting death, they just want the pain to stop and the impulse to end their life does not last forever. So that was a quick recap of those misperceptions. And I was always interested in, you know, having conversations about brain chemistry. So if you if you have a little more insight, you're most welcome to share with us. But I've thought about whether we are able to predict who is at risk of suicide just by drawing a couple of drops of blood and see on a micro level um, in such a way that we can actually prevent suicide before it happens. And can we deduce this from the brain chemistry? So research has shown that there is some significant difference in the brain chemistry of someone who has committed suicide. They found that certain brain regions in people who are suicidal have fewer nerve cells and altered receptors for neurotransmitters. 
So abnormalities related to the neurotransmitter serotonin have been linked to suicide in many studies. So low levels of serotonin have been found in the brains of those who commit suicide. So physiologically, a serotonin deficiency in combination with risk factors, which we will look at in a moment, those external contributing factors such as mental health, loss, or a crisis event may make one more at risk of contemplating or attempting suicide. At most times, an imbalance in the brain will lead to poor mental health, applying ineffective coping strategies and prevents one from reaching out for help. So what are these prevalence and risk factors? We know suicide doesn't discriminate. So while the link between suicide and mental disorders, and in particular depression and alcohol use disorders, is well established in certain countries, many suicides happen impulsively in moments of crisis where there is a breakdown in the ability to deal with the life stresses. And these life stresses can be financial problems, relationship breakups, chronic pain, illness. Suicide rates are also high among certain vulnerable groups who experience discrimination, such as refugees, the LBTIQA persons, and prisoners. By far, the strongest risk factor for suicide is a previous suicide attempt. In terms of age cohorts, adolescent suicide, reported in 2020 and 21, is the second and now fourth leading cause of death among young adolescents and adults. And this is between the ages of 15 and 29, respectively. So approximately 75% suicide cases occur in the middle and low income countries. And the World Health Organization reported globally that males are twice as likely to, di to die by completed suicide compared to females. Recently in the Sunday Times on the 15th of August, they reported men are four times more likely with a side note that this is hitting the nail on the head. They interviewed Casey Chambers, and she mentioned that the interesting thing is that more women may be diagnosed that um, diagnosed with depression than men, and not necessarily that women have more depression than men. Women just don't talk about it and don't seek help. Men are more aggressive in their methods to commit suicide and have more access or means to suicide. So I hope that makes sense. Those living with schizophrenia, so if we're looking at um, comorbidities, during a relapse, following poor adherence to medication and or a treatment plan such as psychotherapy, are 20% more likely to have a suicidal attempt. And this is due to those psychotic episodes and the severity of the symptoms they may experience. In an article in the psychiatry magazine, there were two um, reports. Um, the one titled Workplace Anxiety and COVID reported that 70% living with an anxiety disorder will try to commit suicide regularly throughout their lifetime. And this is as a result of poorer help-seeking behavior skills, poor adherence or inconsistent to attending therapy or their pharmacological interventions adhering to the medication and increased self-neglect, self-sabotage behaviors, high self-harm risk, and inability or ineffective ways in addressing life stresses. Another, uh, yeah, another article in that um, uh, magazine referred to the post-traumatic stress disorder and its association um, and made a direct link between substance abuse and suicide. This in this due in part to the reminders of the traumatic event precipitating the increase in distress and or physiological reaction. So it's a means of escaping, reliving the trauma. Self-harm is associated with several poor outcomes, including attempted and successful suicide. So self-harm is not an attempt to commit suicide, Self-harm is an ineffective coping strategy used to make sense of a difficult situation and can serve as an effective regulation to managing their emotional regulation or punishment. Self-harm increases the rate of suicide to between 50 and 100 times the rate of suicide. So self-harm increases the risk of suicide. So the reasons for attempting suicide varies. 
it's never one reason or one contributing factor. Usually it's a combination of issues and such experience is different for each person. So life traumas such as experiencing conflict, disaster, violence, abuse, loss, perhaps even a sense of isolation is strongly associated with suicidal behavior. And let's be a little more specific, a pandemic. We've seen we've lost uh, people we love. There is an increase in loneliness and isolation. There's been an ex uh, increase in exposure to distress for long periods of time. Bullying, cyberbullying, and we see that suicide associated with bullying or cyberbullying are common. And there is a term called bully side, perhaps even uh, implementing ineffective coping strategies, emotional instability, financial instability, financial insecurity, moving away from home, academic workplace pressures, trauma, living with an untreated mental illness, a relapse or poor adherence to medication, a sudden crisis. All these factors make an individual feel overwhelmed, helpless, and hopeless. In situations such as the current pandemic and the ones I've just mentioned, we find many with an increased sense of uncertainty, hopelessness, and equality. Michelle Donnelly, who's a project leader of advocacy and awareness of the South African Federation for Mental Health, encourages us all to promote suicide prevention. And we see that there are many risk factors that may lead someone to think about suicide. Suicides are preventable. Prevention actions eliminate the recurrences. And when we're eliminating the recurrences of uh, suicide attempts, there are, it's a, it's a decrease in the, the opportunity of losing someone from um, to suicide. So these preventative actions include staff, student training sessions, curriculum changes that address the importance of diversity, respect, equality, and reinforces those positive behaviors in both the lecture room, in the training room, and in the workplace spaces all of which were intended to aid the process of successful social development. And I think basically what I'm saying here is we all have a role to create spaces where we can speak about ways to eliminate um, the, the choice of wanting to commit suicide. So what are the warning signs? So talking about dying, where the person will make mention of dying or disappearing or other types of self-harm. They may allude to, um, you know, having lost someone important to them, um, whether it's through death, divorce, separation, broken relationship, self-esteem, uh, where they're unable to continue doing the things that they previously enjoyed, that there is a change in their personality, maybe slightly more um, withdrawn, a little more sad, irritable, anxious, tired, indecisive, apathetic, perhaps noticed a change in their behavior, their inability to concentrate on work or on their academic demands um, or familial um, responsibilities or that there is, uh, you know, less completion of those routine tasks. And we'll notice this in unusual, unexpected calls saying goodbye as if we're not going to be seeing them again. A change in sleep pattern, sleeping too much or sleeping too little, or perhaps even just a mention of, you know, nightmares even. A change in eating habits, eating too much, eating too little, weight gain or weight loss. A low self-esteem, a sense of feeling worthless, shame, overwhelming guilt, self-hatred. They express feeling like a burden. Everyone will be better off without me are the words they would use to describe their experience. They may have no hope for the future, believing things will never get better or that nothing will ever change. So these are simple warning signs that are out there um, that alludes to someone actually indicating I need help. If there's time, I will show uh, a video that encompasses a little bit of the warning signs that I've spoken to and the treatment options. So speaking about suicide, so opening up about mental health problems and or suicidal feelings can be very difficult. And anyone who does so should always be treated with respect and kindness. So have those conversations, raise awareness, break down those stigmas, and it's important in doing this in preventing suicide. 
be fact-based and equip yourself with helpful information. So equip yourself with the necessary information you need to be able to help anyone to develop that help seeking behavior in ourselves and in others and have that um, go to contact details. Build mental health literacy. Have an anti-suicide plan or a contract with that person you're with. Uh, be present. Sometimes all that is needed is company and encourage good habits. Be yourself. Let the person know you care and that they are not alone. Avoid saying things like, you will be okay. Rather ask, what do you need right now that I can help you with? Chances are that just being there is enough. So when speaking to someone who is suicidal, validate their feelings and indicate to them that they may need to speak to someone who is better able to help. May I accompany you? Or let's call this person. Here is a toll-free number. Let's try it out. Always take someone seriously when they are speaking about suicide. Be aware of any of your dual or multiple roles and rather refer to a professional mental health practitioner who may help. This may be a psychologist, a medical practitioner, casual doctor, a casualty doctor on call, a psychiatrist, a social worker. Be aware that there may be people that may judge the person with the feelings of suicide and be told how selfish they may be in wanting to take their lives. And then this encourages that isolation and further withdrawal and amplifies the hopelessness and helplessness. So provide reassurance and avoid blame. Reaching out for help is not easy. And this is mostly due to that fear of being judged and living a life filled with this constant thought of, I do not want to live with these feelings. It's easier to be away. I don't want to wake up and think about this. So seek the help of a mental health practitioner. It may be difficult to get the help a suicidal person needs. So call a crisis line for advice and referrals. Encourage the person you, you're with to seek help from a mental health care professional. They will do a proper medical assessment and address any underlying mental health conditions they may need treatment for. They will make additional recommendations such as support group or psychotherapy as examples. You can help them remain on treatment. It may take a little bit of time for someone to develop a routine that now includes medication. Um, or attendance to psychotherapy. Encouraging someone is important. So do those check-ins and see if they've taken their meds or attended their session. Be proactive, drop by, call, and don't wait for them to ask for help as we know it may be difficult at times to reach out. It may take time from your daily schedule, but the check-in allows the person to feel valued and important. Encourage healthy, lifestyle changes, sleep, healthy diet, have a social calendar, all helps with living life again. Leisure pursuits and exercise is the best medicine for relieving stress and promotes emotional stability and physical well-being. Make a safety plan, and I will share a, a booklet via email, a great resource on how to set up a safety plan uh, for a family member, a friend, a colleague, and it will include a commitment to reach out first, who to call when feeling low or thinking about suicide, a commitment to themselves to try something first. And the suicide booklet uh, was created by SADAG. Remove those potential means of suicide, continue your support over time, um, especially after an event or thoughts of suicide, stay in touch with that person. Your support helps them on their recovery plan and they will feel supported and cared for. And this can translate into a, as simple as a five minute phone call. Supporting a loved one who is chronically suicidal can be quite stressful and exhausting. So you may be afraid and feel guilty and helpless at times. So take advantage of resources about suicide and suicide prevention so that you have information and tools to take action when needed and that you can actually also look after yourself. So take care of yourself by getting support from friends, family, organizations and professionals, especially if you're supporting someone who is suicidal. Lighting a candle is something we have done for centuries in honor of our lost persons. And an estimated loss of one life once lived every hour is the current stats. So if you want to do something in memory of someone you love, 
who is no longer with you, lighting a candle is a simple, easy way to feel peace and connection. For many, this is a way to celebrate the life of a loved one who is also reflecting on and while reflecting on your own memories. While lighting a candle, you may want to reflect what that person meant to you. You can recite a poem, a prayer. You can even meditate on some words. There are no rules for what you need to think about or say. But having a way of acknowledging the loss or celebrating the life once lived makes it a little easier every day if you have lost someone to suicide. Tonight at the Mental Health Reset Program, we will be addressing grief and bereavement, adjusting to life after a loss. Um, yeah, and more will be spoken about that there. So there's a range of apps and support programs available to reach out for help. And just a side note, apps are not there to replace the mental health care practitioner. It is one of those coping mechanisms established to help establish healthier behaviors, part of your mental health first aid kit, part of your treatment plan, and the same for support groups. I'm just going to quickly um, pop in a, a link. Let me just quickly get to the link that is going to give you access to the top 2022 mental health apps. And I've also post a link for a Saturday website that speaks to, you know, that speaks to all the things that you may need to know um, that will help you equip yourself with the necessary knowledge that you may need. Perfect. So SADAC has just shared over 80 new support groups across the country. So there is a support group for those that have um, mental health condition or have lost a loved one from suicide or is actively uh, you know living with suicidal ideation so look out on their website for the support group so in total they have over 160 um, support groups presently um, and one person has said that what they've learned from a support group is to listen to myself respect my feelings and reach out for help when I need it without embarrassment or fear in the next few slides I'm going to be sharing some contact details that um, you may need, whether you, a family member or a friend or a colleague may need assistance and may need to contact um, someone. And we have the Suicide Crisis Helpline, which is the SADAC line 0800-567-567. And their other toll-free line is 0800-456-789. And that's also, both are available 24 hours. We have the Young Doctors and St Medical Students Helpline as well from Discovery, which is 0800-323-323. And we also have the Suicidal Crisis Line SMS number, which is 31393. And a telephone counsellor will contact you and respond to your message. We also have now newly released the SADAG WhatsApp counseling line. It's 0871632030. And there is this campaign called Brave Together, Maybelline and SADAG partnered to launch this new WhatsApp counseling line. And this initiative aims to create more safer spaces for people dealing with depression and anxiety. Um, and they can then reach out for help and encourage more people to seek out for help and support. And they've recognized that in a world where they are one in five are estimated to be affected by anxiety and, de and depression, women are disproportionately impacted. We know that our mental health conditions within the country are ongoing and untreated. And they've reported that nine out of 10 people with a mental health issue will not have access to a mental health care, um, you know, access to mental health care or treatment. So many people don't know how to access help for their mental health issues or are too afraid to talk about it and don't seek help for their problems. So this kind of helpline encourages a safer space, a space where people can reach out for free help, whether they are at work, school, home, on a bus, 
they can access free help through the WhatsApp line. Making mental health services accessible is key in our prevention and once and accessing the service that equips one with coping skills, finding ways in addressing factors affecting our lives, finding acceptance is empowering and is hope giving. I've also got Lifeline's contact number. Their national counseling line is 0861 322 And I've also put the GBV, Stop Gender Based Violence, uh, toll free line 0800 150 150. So I spoke about Michelle earlier, and this is the, you know, a little snippet of their website. They do a lot of psychoeducation. And they, on their website, they address aspects of bullying, drug and alcohol use, exam stress, self-harm, social media risks, suicide, mental disorders and intellectual disorders, disabilities. So with that, I'm saying thank you. And thank you, Matters. I appreciate you. And I'm just going to quickly play the second video that I have planned. Um, and, and, um, enclosure and I like this video because it puts into perspective from a um, healthcare practitioner perspective as lab technicians as doctors working within the workplace when one of our patients or clients say I need assistance this video will also speak to treatment plans <music> My patient was in trouble. I asked him about suicide, and he was thinking about it. She'd stopped her medication and said she was only there because I'd be mad if she no-showed. We put a safety plan together for her. I saw him several times over the past six weeks after his diagnosis, and he was worse each time. He had started to think about suicide. It was clear that we needed to treat this appointment as an emergency session. She told me she didn't trust herself to stay safe, and she asked for help. Working with someone considering suicide can be challenging for the most seasoned clinician. Because many people see their primary care provider in the weeks before dying by suicide, you are in a unique position to recognize a crisis and save a life. Know the risks and warning signs. Some are obvious, such as talking about suicide or death. Some are not as obvious, like seeking access to a weapon. If your patient talks about feeling hopeless, worthless, or is severely depressed, ask if they are considering suicide. Monitor treatment adherence and mood. If your patient isn't adhering to treatment and her or his mood is worsening, ask if they are thinking about suicide. Ask about major life changes. Pay particular attention to significant losses such as divorce, job loss or the death of a family member or close friend, especially if by suicide. Medical history matters. If your patient has recently been diagnosed with a significant medical condition or they seem to be resisting treatment and are irritable, sad or hopeless, they are at increased risk of suicide. Risk for suicide can vary greatly from day to day and even within a single day or hour. Fortunately, there are effective interventions for both short and long-term treatment of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Emergency care. For immediate help, patient safety is the only priority. Emergency room staff are prepared to address and intervene in suicidal thoughts or actions. Short-term care. Safety planning and crisis response planning are interventions that you and your staff can provide. With minimal training, medical staff can determine when the risk of suicide exists and address behaviors to keep patients safe, including outlining coping strategies, identifying personal contacts and resources, and creating a concrete list of people available to help the patient. Long-term care. There are at least three cognitive behavior therapy, suicide-specific protocols that are effective in reducing suicide attempts. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicidal Patients or CBTSP Brief Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicidal Individuals or BCBT and Dialectical Behavior Therapy or DBT 
are all evidence-based treatments focused on reducing suicidal behavior. You will encounter patients who are suicidal at some point during your professional career. Knowing what to look for and how to speak about treatment could save your patient's life. Suicidal thoughts are common. Suicidal behaviors can be lethal. But with your attention, skills and effective treatments for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, they don't have to be. Okay, so thank you so much for the question on the safety plan. I'm just going to quickly open the safety plan. And it is something that I found um, it was newly released by a SADAC. It's called the SADAC Suicidal Brochure. And I'm just going to do a quick screen share. And while I do the screen share of the brochure, I'm just going to quickly find the direct link. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I saw in the video that they mentioned um, the importance of having lists of contacts available. I assume that was uh, part of it. You assume that was? I'm so sorry, of, broke up. So yeah, I think <laughs> I assume that was part of the uh, safety plan, making sure that um, the ease are there all contact details available in cases of emergency? I see you've sent the link in the chat box. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's such a pleasure. And I really like this. And this is nice for, um, you know, in, in, in your professional practice, in, in the community, for a family member, a friend. And it is really nice and user-friendly. And it encourages um, a plan A. Um, it encourages, I commit to looking after myself and this is my plan first before I consider suicide. Um, I think it's always important to put as one of the contact numbers as an after hours toll free line such as SADAG or the Suppler Mental Health Suicide Crisis Line. Um, and this, yeah, um, and you can see that we've got the SADAG suicide line over here, the 567, 567. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I would like to mention about the booklet and I think it gives you enough information yeah to refer to when when you're needing to speak about suicide and um, the impact that it may have um, if you're wanting to speak about this with colleagues in an open forum or with a family member yeah I saw on that plan that um, I, I like the idea of committing to to a few steps to put in mm -hmm. place. Um, you know, like it's so easy for us to become overwhelmed. Um, here, here's what I'm going to do when that does happen. I'm going to breathe deeply. I'm going to speak to this person. I'm going to grab my phone and contact this person. So, uh, you know, just to have that plan in place, tangible, Absolutely. I think is so important. Otherwise, you know, the weight of the world would probably just weigh on your shoulders and, you know, it's difficult to manage. Uh, I'm loving the safety plan. Mm. Um, you're, you're speaking about something so critical. It's it's part of your mental health first aid kit. It's like, um, this is your resource bank. This is what you have within yourself to be able to look after yourself. And also as part of when I'm not able to look after myself, who can I ask and um, help me on this journey? Mm -hmm. Also found that it was so profound during this session, this concept that we all have a role to play in, in prevention. And, you know, the importance of awareness, not only for yourself, but what's happening around you, um, noting somebody else's circumstances. Um, I had a question uh, related to that, if you don't mind. Um, you know, it's unfortunate we probably all know someone um, who may have committed suicide. And, you know, 
they, they, they are people being left behind. And Absolutely. how do we help them, you know, the friends and family um, who seem to have the sense of guilt and sadness, the we should have seen the signs or I, I saw the signs and I didn't do anything or I didn't know I was not enough, I could have helped. How do we support them? I mean, in some sense, Absolutely. you know, that's us as well. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's such an important question because we are the ones still, you know, present having to manage the loss. And we we would deal with the loss in the same way we would grieve a loss of um, a family member, you know, who who's um, passed away in a different kind of way. We will go through a, a, a grieving process. There will be a lot of blame self-blame a lot of negative thinking a lot of um I'm trying to think there there's a um um a, a concept and it's such a pity I can't recall the the name the term for it but when we experience a loss following suicide we're slightly more at risk of suicide ourselves because of that intense um regret of I should have taken care of this person or, or taken taken them seriously um and it, it is definitely something that uh, we we need to look after ourselves through reaching out recognizing your own process of recovery is so important knowing your signs or symptoms of I'm not okay um have your own checklist to say um I might be at risk of um I know experiencing uh, grief and bereavement um, and, and needing help. Um, I think, you know, when you're finding it difficult to sleep, your appetite changes, your mood is, you know, up and down, you're irritable, you're snappy. Um, and, and those are normal responses to experience following a loss of, of a loved one. Um, yeah. It's, it's knowing and identifying within you your own resources of support, making sure that you have your own support team that is there for when you need help, when you're feeling stuck and, you know, feeling intensely sad or just needing company. Um, I know there was another slide. Um, yeah, by the support groups. There is a support group that is for those who are living with lo uh, lost ones to suicide. And I think it's really important to be in a support group um, or a support network that encourages this kind of conversation and healing. Um, I am aware that uh, there will be certain times during a year where there would be a greater sense of feeling that loss, like anniversaries, birthday celebrations, um, maybe an annual event that you, you would be attending with that person who's no longer with us. And it kind of sparks that, that process again of grief and bereavement. Um, so it's knowing and preparing for that, um, that event. And that's part of your, pro of your healing process too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially like that comment about the the lighting a candle um in, in celebration of the life of uh someone who has passed from suicide mm. okay. yeah and it's just starting just the process of i acknowledge that you're no longer with me um and that's okay for now mm. it's a good start Are they, I suppose I should open up the, the floor for any questions. Um, are there any uh, comments or questions for Sue today about such a very important topic, um, especially within our context here in higher education, where we're constantly bombarded with stress and the potential for being overwhelmed, if not ourselves, our colleagues as well. Um, I'm sure Sue would be happy to to address any questions as well as the team. Right. Otherwise, um, your the contact details uh, Sue's put in the chat box um, for SADAG and uh, oh goodness, what was the other one? It was quite nice. Lifeline, and we have. Let me just go to Lifeline. 
that's lifeline over there 0861 and um, should you wish to connect with a student counselor you're most welcome to email us on css.sss at ukcdm.ac.za a front desk administrator will receive your query for an appointment you do not need to say for what purpose just indicate and provide dates and times as well as your contact numbers to when you would like to connect with a student counselor fantastic thank you so much for that sue i mean it's wonderful to know that there are so many resources available to you know raise awareness and also to foster safer spaces for people to discuss and really explore mental health um, I think the session has really been so apt uh, considering, you know, yesterday was the, the 10th of October, Mental Health Awareness Day. Um, so thank you so much for being here today and speaking about such a very important topic uh, with the group. Um, right, so I guess that would be the end of today's uh, session. Uh, next week, uh, the 18th of October, we have Colleen Aldis leading a discussion about managing your supervisor. Uh, this will be conducted along with several students in the panel as well. Uh, it's sure to be a goodie too. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Sue, for, for hosting today and all the participants for joining. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay.